Open your Bibles to the book of um, Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, and uh, we're going to continue our study in the book of Galatians, and um, this is a, um, an important book for believers and for the body of Christ to understand and to know because of we just know in general what's going on in the world today is that the law gets mixed into grace and then it's a, it's a little bit of a mess out there and a misunderstanding of God's Word. And what's happened with these Galatians, these Judaizers has come in and um, told them to go back to the law and try and make themselves righteous by the law. And um, so Paul is, um, ri uh, is, is writing this, and, and is obvi obviously God is giving these words, and is giving them by inspiration, this correctional book, because there's some bad believing in going on in Galatians regarding the doctrine of justification by faith. And they want to take the doctrine of just justification by faith, and they allow the works of the law to come and be in there and make these two, to try and, and marry these two. Paul writes to these folks in Galatians, says there's no way that you can marry justification by faith and the works of the law. You just can't do the two. You can't mix them up, you know. And, uh, and if you do that, you are bewitched if you do that, you know. And that's another gospel, which is not even an, another, another gospel, you know. And, and you need to be careful about that. So, and so we saw so far in the first chapter, we, we, we spent... A Four sessions on that, on, that, on that verses from about verse 11 where he says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. We spent about four lessons on that, looking at that, how Paul was certifying his gospel and uh, the certification of his gospel, that his gospel was number one, not after man, was not by man. And this gospel was purely by revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ that gave him his gospel. And, and, he, and he proves in Galatians that when the, the day that he got saved, the day that he got saved, you know, he didn't run to Jerusalem and say to them, to the apostles, okay, what shall I preach? But we know that he preached for at least three years before the first time he got to Jerusalem and before he um, you know, even met Peter, he was preaching for three years what he was given and what he understood. Okay, and so, and, 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 and that just proves that Paul's gospel was not after man, okay? But anyway, we'll get back into some of that this morning, but let's go read in chapter 2, and we'll possibly only get through the first five verses this morning. We'll see how it goes. In um, Galatians chapter 2, and verse 1 says, Then fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because the false bread and unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seemed to be somewhat... Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mightily in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. And we're going to read so far this morning there. Father, we thank you this morning that we can consider your word. We thank you that we can look at these verses. And we thank you that as we believe it and trust it 
and come by faith to it that you give us the understanding in these things and we praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. He starts off the book of and, and Galatians and uh, chapter 2, he ca- it, it seemed, uh, it's a continuation of what has been going on when he started off. Paul is busy defending his apostleship because his apostleship and his specific apostleship is under attack. Okay, and he's defending that and, 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 and not that he as a man needs to defend it, God is defending his apostleship because God gives these words by inspiration. And he's continuing the subject of the chronology, what happened um, after, he received, after he got saved and, 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 and how did he now go to Jerusalem. And, and, he's, and he's dealing with that. So this chapter 2, we're going to see that Paul is going to carry on it. He's not received his gospel from man. He had not derived it from the apostles. He didn't go to Peter, to James, or John and ask them, what is the gospel I should preach now? It's very clear from that. He did not acknowledge his indebtedness to them for his views of the Christian religion. He, you know, he didn't have to go to them, okay, to do that. Okay? They not, and, and, we, and it's clear in this chapter we're going to see that they didn't even set their authority up over him, which is clear. They understood that his apostleship was from the Lord. Okay? And so we're going to see these things uh, as, we, as we study that verse for verse. Okay? There's two main things that I see in my understanding and in my opinion here. Okay? I'm not giving you doctrine now. I'm just giving you my opinion and my view of this chapter. Okay? There's two parts, main, two main parts in this chapter. The first part is his visit to Jerusalem. What was it about? About communicating the gospel that he was preaching. The second one is that he withstood Peter to the face. Now, I wonder what, what, what people do about this passage who says Peter is more important than Paul. Paul is really not, not nobody. But God gives his by inspiration. That God appoints his man and he withstood the so-called great apostle, which I'm not saying Peter is not a great apostle. But he withstood him to the face because he, does, he did contrary, Peter did contrary to the gospel that was preached. So it shows me that he didn't, Peter didn't usurp authority over Paul. As a matter of fact, in this dispensation, guess who had the authority? Paul had. Because he withstood Peter to the face and says, you're wrong in what you're allowing and what you're doing. And we're going to get into that when we get to the second part of this chapter. Okay? And um, so, so the, this is the, th- the things that is at hand here. And, um, and we're going to look at that and try to go into that into a little bit of a detail with that. Let's start in, in verse 1 there. The first... Verse says, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. What is the first word in that first verse? Then. When you start off something with then, it tells me it follows chronologically. It follows naturally something that was said before and it's just carrying on with something. Okay? When Paul wrote this and was penning this and God gives these by inspiration and has been written down this letter, this epistle he's writing, there was no chapters and verses in it. It was just a, just a letter. And so he goes then, and so then obviously goes to what, what and he, he continues and in chrono- chrono- chronologically, what was happened in chapter 1. So almost we can say this is the fifth part to his certification of, his go- of, of Paul's my gospel, but we're not going to call it that message, okay? Um, we're going to call, uh, the, 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 I've, I've called this message, Paul, the Pauline authority communicated in Jerusalem. The Pauline authority communicated in Jerusalem. So, so what... what so what happens here? Let, let's see where we are. He says, then 14 years after. So this is 14 years after something. Now, if you go to most commentaries, and you go read commentaries, and you get, and the commentary is what somebody wrote about the Bible, most people will say 14 years after is after his conversion. It's after he got saved. It's 14 years. I don't believe that. I think this is at least 17 years after he got saved when he went up here. Okay? Because when, when he got to Jerusalem, 17 years, uh, uh, just all, at minimum 17 years before he gets to Jerusalem, the second time. Okay? So, um, what happens here? So, let's look at it quickly here. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 17, when he gives you the certification of his, what happened to him, straight after verse 16, verse 16, he says, To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to where? Jerusalem, to, uh, to them which were apostles before me, but I went into where? Arabia, 
and departed again into Damascus. Now, I'll put a little map up here for you to see. And, 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 and um, where is my little... Um, somebody was going to bring me a pointer that is much better than this pointer. I'm not going to mention names, Toby. Um, and now it's not working. Okay, maybe that's why. Here we go. So, Damascus, he was on his way to Damascus. And uh, he says, what he did when he got saved, he says he didn't go immediately after he got saved and ran down to Jerusalem and to find, find out, okay, what was I need to preach? I didn't go there. I went into Arabia, which is these deserts around the, 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 the wilderness and stuff. This side of, we go from that way into Arabia, and there's a mountain uh, uh, range that follows it. I am no, I am no um, what do you call it, uh, geographical guy. So I could point in the complete wrong direction there. But I know he, he didn't go there. That's what I know. He went into a secluded area. And he went from there. And from there, he went back to where? Tarsus. Okay. And so that's what... Or, 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 sorry, sorry. He went into... He, I got it wrong. He, he gets saved. He goes into Arabia and then comes back to Damascus. Okay, that's what the verses tell us. And, uh, and so, verse 17, Neither went up to Jerusalem, to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again and unto Damascus. Then look at verse from Damascus. He says, Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. So after three years, he's been there after he got saved. So he's been, he, got, he gets saved, he, he gets saved. He goes into Arabia, comes back to Damascus. He's there for three years, and then after three years, he goes to where? Jerusalem. At that visit to Jerusalem, did he meet all the apostles? No, he only met Peter and James, right? The, the, the brother of the Lord. He meets in, 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 in Jerusalem. After Jeru Look at verse 18 and 19, he says, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. That's all he saw there, right? Now, what happens after that? Well, verse 21. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by the face unto the churches of Judea. That's Syria and Cilicia into that region. That is his area where he was functioning now in. And he's functioning there before he gets back to Jerusalem in that area is there. Before he gets back to Jerusalem, he said 14 years away from before he gets to Jerusalem again. Okay? So, verse 21 says, Afterwards I came into the region of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by the face of the churches of Judea which were at Christ. The next thing where you find Paul coming on, and, and after, after um, remember where the first time he was in Jerusalem, he was led down by a basket and he had to flee the city. He goes out and he goes back, he goes back to those areas there. The next person that shows up is, Barnabas, and Barnabas goes and seeks Saul, and he goes and finds him where? In Tarsus. And you can find that in the book of Acts. And so after he, goes, he flees, he goes to, to Tarsus. And look for me in Acts chapter 11, verse 25. I'm just showing you a little bit of a background here, you know. And I hope I'm getting it straight. But um, in Acts chapter 11... The beautiful thing is you can go back to the Scriptures and get it straight. <laughs> it's, it's all in the Scriptures here, all right? Um, Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So Barnabas goes and finds him and, at Tarsus and takes him to Antioch, all right? And he's there for a year and, and assembled himself there. Then Paul comes into chapter 2, of verse 1, and says, Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem. So if you take three years before he gets the first time to Jerusalem after his salvation, then another four, it's 17 years we have at least here. Okay? What happens in Acts chapter 2? What happens in Acts chapter 2? I'm going to give you my understanding and what I believe Acts chapter 2 is. What's happening in the book of, oh, sorry, Acts, sorry, Galatians chapter 2 is what's happening in Acts chapter 15, okay? Again, I say to you, do not go to Acts to find your chronology, chronology because it's laid out in Galatians, the chronology, okay? Not in Acts. So, and then he goes up there, so that's basically what I want to show you there, and then he goes down to Jerusalem, obviously, let me switch this off quickly. 
And um, so, and, and, Acts, and uh, Galatians chapter 2 is what happens in Acts chapter 15, and you're going to see we're going to refer a little bit to that passage there, okay? Now go back to verse 1 of Acts, uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 2. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. So he goes to Jerusalem. Who does he take with him? Barnabas. So the natural question for the Bible student would be, who's Barnabas? Where's Barnabas come from? Okay. And so the natural thing is, how do you look for Barnabas? You go into the Scriptures and you look up Barnabas. And you see where he shows up first. And by, by, by all means, do not forget... When you study the Scriptures, you can find, like Antioch, it's not always the same place Antioch. You can have Antioch in Syria, and you can have Antioch up in Asia. You can have Antioch different places. When had, every time you read, we just did Thursday night in our Bible study, Thursday night study um, with some of the students, and um, Simon, the word Simon, how many times does Simon appear in the Scriptures? You better get it right now. Twelve times, okay? He was right. Um, Twelve times Simon appears in the, in the New Testament Scriptures, and it's not all the same Simon. So you've got to be careful about that. But Barnabas here shows up the first time in the book of Acts. I see Barnabas in Acts. Um, just go with me back to Acts 15 first. Book of Acts chapter 15. And then we'll go back to Acts chapter 4. <coughs> In Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, uh, dissension and disput disputation with them, disputation with them they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain of the other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about the question. So obviously this Barnabas that Paul took with him is this Barnabas he's talking about here in Acts chapter 15 and he's taking him to Jerusalem to discuss this issue that they have, the, the disputation, disputation dis, why am I not getting that word right? Disputation right, uh, 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 about, okay? And, and Barnabas was part of that. But go back with me to Acts chapter 4. Um, verse 36, it says, and, um, verse this, and verse 36 says, And Joseph, whose by the, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So Joseph, who has been surnamed Barnabas, okay, um, Barnabas, by the, by, by, by the disciples, by the apostles, sorry, he was, he was the body of Christ. Was Paul saved yet at this time? Or is he a, a possibly a member of the kingdom church, of the Messianic church at this time? Barnabas. Is he a kingdom saint or is he a kingdom saint? Okay. So we're clear about that. That's who he is. It's the same Barnabas that, went since, that the church uh, sends off, and, and he goes and seeks Paul, and Paul joins, and, 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 brings, and he brings Paul now, Saul, that became Paul, down to Antioch, and they start ministering. Then obviously, Paul is ministering the message that he's got, and he understands some things, and Barnabas obviously knows what he's teaching, and is teaching it with him. When we go back to Acts chapter 13, if you will, before we get to Back, back to 15 there. In Acts chapter 13, Barnabas is now at Antioch with, with, with Paul. Now they were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaim, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said... Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I've called them. So God is taking this Barnabas, and He says, Take Saul with uh, him and Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul, and separate him unto the work that I've called him. So God is going to use a kingdom saint alongside with Paul, a body of Christ saint, and to go and do the work of the ministry. Because the one knows what's going on there. And the other one knows what has been revealed and given to him, and they're going to go now and spread the gospel, which is now the gospel of the day. 
By the way, the gospel of the circumcision wasn't the gospel of the day that went out and spread out. God's cut his program off with the nation of Israel. Okay, so Barnabas is with him. By the way, go back with me to Acts chapter 15. Barnabas goes to, with Paul to Acts, in Acts 15. If you look through to verse, let me think. I didn't write it down, so I need to think about it here quickly. Barnabas and, 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 and Paul, shortly, uh, even within the chapter 15 of Acts, has, they have contention, they have an issue regarding John Mark, nephew to Barnabas. And look at verse, and, and, but verse 38, it says, But Paul, verse 37, And Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not a good to take him with him, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. So this John Mark didn't go with them to work. He did something else. And Paul says, It's not a good idea for us to take him with us. Barnabas says, No, we should. Paul says, No, we shouldn't. So, and, and verse 39 says, And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder from one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto where? Cyprus. Where was the Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 from that sold his land and, and things? Cyprus. So he returns to Cyprus. By the way, it's the last time in the book of Acts that you're going to read about Barnabas. Last mention of Barnabas in the book of Acts. He did what God has called him to do. He, he was busy part, part of that. He did what he did with Saul there. And that was the end of it. And now he's moving. He's going back to Cyprus. And Saul is, uh, uh, Paul is now carrying on. And other guys like Timothy and Titus. And these guys become his companions. Obviously Luke is with him all the way. Another kingdom saint that's with, with, with um, Paul all the way. You guys get what I'm saying? So go back with me to Galatians chapter 2. Now, I know some of you are going to come to me and say, oh, I'm confused now. What, what, give me the time span and what I do. Let me tell you something. You sit down with your Bible, and you write down the verse where you see him first come up. Write the verse down. And the next time you see him up, you write the verse down. And before you know it, you'll have the, the layout of what happens, the events and stages of events. Okay? I want to get into some of the issues and the doctrines in this chapter here. So, Verse two, chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. So now we see another guy is not just Barnabas, but he takes who with? Titus. Who is Titus? Well, Titus chapter, chapter 1, in the book of Titus chapter 1, look at what called, Paul calls Titus. In chapter 1 and the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 4. He says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Paul considers Titus obviously a faithful man, and you can read a lot about Titus in, this, in, 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 in Paul's epistles, but Titus is a faithful man. He's an assertive man, he's, he, he, and, 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 and he's an upright man, but Paul calls him a son after the common faith. So he determines him a son after the common faith. Same way that Paul thought of who else? Called him a son as well. Timothy. So Paul takes this, he takes Barnabas with him, a kingdom saint, and takes Titus, I believe a body of Christ saint, and Titus is a Greek, and he, is he circumcised? Yes or no? No, he's not circumcised. And so, and, and he goes to Jerusalem with an uncircumcised Greek to discuss the issue of what? Circumcision. Now, that's a little bit bold, isn't it? Okay, but that's how it worked, and that's, that's how God wanted to play out. Okay, and we're going to look at that now. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 2. So it's 14 years later, he went up, goes up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So the first thing we see in that chapter, how does Paul go up there? By revelation. If you go back to the book of Acts, chapter 15 again, Acts chapter 15, and the first couple of verses there, we'll just do the first two verses. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the man of Moses, ye cannot be saved. 
When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders aboard about the question. Now I say to you, when you, where do you find your doctrine? Your doctrine for the body of Christ. The doctrine today in this dispensation of grace, where do you find your doctrine? Do you find your doctrine in the book of Acts? Or do you find your doctrine in Romans to Philemon? Romans to Philemon. And Paul says in Romans to Philemon and Galatians, I went up by what? Revelation. So when he determined he needs to go up, that determination came, comes after. It's, it is, it, that determination wasn't, we determined you must go. No. Paul got the revelation, says God wants me to go up there and sort this thing out. And they said, let's, yeah, let's go. See, the doctrine is laid out for you what happened. Okay. And, and, and that's just not man's figuring it out. It's God wanting this to happen. And he goes by revelation. By the way, all Paul's revelation was by visions. Okay, that's the Macedonian vision. He had all these vision, the Corinthian vision, the Jerusalem vision, um, etc., etc. And God appears to him and tells him what to do. And he speaks with the Lord. Okay. But why does he go up to Jerusalem? Well, verse 2 says in Galatians chapter 2, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. So what did he do? What did he go and do at Jerusalem? He's going to go tell them, and he's going to instruct them, and he's going to communicate with them the gospel that he's preaching. And if he does that, he, he, by the way, Paul doesn't go there, and I'll, I'm going to show you just out of this passage, he doesn't go there to say to the apostles, okay guys, give me a score out of ten. Am I, am I getting it right? This is the gospel that I'm preached, so is it, is it good? It's all good? No, no. He goes up and says, God gave me this message. This is the message I'm preaching. I'm not asking you, is it okay that I preach it? I'm not asking you, is it right? I'm saying you, this is the gospel God gave to me, and I, want to, I need to communicate to you, and you need to understand that, that this gospel excludes circumcision, baptisms, and everything else that you think about. This is the gospel. It's the gospel of God's grace that He reveals to me. I'm not looking for validation. Now you can read verse 2 and it seems like he's doing that. That I might run in vain or, or, had, or had run in vain. Or shoot or had run in vain. But that's not what he's doing here. He's going them to preach the gospel to them. Okay, the, There was an issue. and that, Go back to um, uh, Acts chapter 15 again for me. Verse 1 says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised of the man of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas, so they said you can't be saved unless you be what? Circumcised. Now by the way, let me ask you this. That Peter, James, and John preach a message that circumcision saves you. Never, ever do I believe in my mind that the apostles preach a message like that. The guys who preach the message like that is the false brethren. Okay? But he goes up there because circumcision is obviously part of the Israel's program. Okay? But they misappropriated that, obviously. So Paul goes and says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and a certain other of them should go to Jerusalem and the apostles and elders about the question. And being brought on them by the ch church, they passed through Phoenix and so, um, Samaria, declaring the um, conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying, this is, that, 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 is what needful, that, that it was needful to be circumcised them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the, epistles and, the el and, and the apostles and the elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, so <laughs> among these apostles in Jerusalem, guess what? There's now disputing going on about the subject now. That means everybody's not on the, same, on the same page, especially these believing, they're called 
those Pharisees which believed, they caused a lot of the dip, dis, disputation there. Okay? So Paul goes there to set this thing straight, and he's going to share it with him, and we're going to see how this is going to play out. Okay? By the way, the gospel that Paul preached, go with me a little couple of pages, pages back in Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, Paul is preaching in Antioch of, at Pisidia. And Paul is preaching a message here. And verse... Um, Verse 34, and as concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this, this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he said also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Verse 36, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto the fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. So he's preaching the resurrection. Okay. Now verse 37, verse 38 says, Be it known unto you, therefore, says Paul, men and brethren, and through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of what? Moses. So Paul's message is justification by faith without what? The law of Moses. Was it a possible according to Paul's, my gospel, that you could be justified by the law of Moses? It's very clear he preached a country message. These false brethren said, you have to be circumcised to be saved. And if you're saved, you have to be circumcised, etc., etc., etc. So this is, the, this, is, this, this is the area where the question is about. What Paul did is he established churches in Galatia, in the region of Galatia, and these churches got established on the basis of justification by faith. Christ finished work on the cross of Calvary, His death, His burial, and resurrection, and these false brethren comes in, follows after, and starts bringing in and saying, you need to obey the Sabbath, and you need to be circumcised, you need to do all these things of the law, or else you can't be righteous. So that's where the, and, and you have to be circumcised. Paul says, no, that's, I didn't get that message from God. And, and there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a fight about this. There's a, there's a struggle about this issue. And Paul withstands him. He says, you know what? And God says, you need to go to Jerusalem and set this issue straight. And go speak to the apostles. And when he speaks to the apostles, the apostles get together with all the other men there. And, this, and they have disputations among themselves about what's right and not wrong. What, what's right and what's wrong. You know, and there's this thing going on here about this subject. Let me tell you something about this. In the church today, maybe not with the subject of circumcision, but with everything else, baptisms and everything else, it is the same disputation that's going on. And the, and the reason why it's going on today is because the, 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 there's no acknowledging that Paul is the apostle and that his gospel is the gospel for today. That's why we have these contentions and disputations among believers today is because of this very same fact that's going on. Can you see why it is so important that the book of Galatians was written so that we can take note of what was going on here? Because it was an area of contention even among the believers of the day. And God says, you cannot, you cannot mix the two. There's two different Gospels. And we're going to get into that as we get through, this, to, uh, through chapter, the chapter here. Okay. Now let me go there. Verse 2 says, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that Gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. And I told you it's Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, obviously. But privately to them which were of reputation, that just by any means I should run or had run in vain. Paul is not saying here, you know, I went to these guys privately, of them that's in reputation. Now at least I know three people that was of reputation among them. And who were they? Galatians 2.9 tells me who they were. James, Cephas, and John. 
at least these guys were there, and there was obviously other apostles too. He says, I'm communicated to them because, you know what, this message is so important that I'm defending you. I want to know, I, they need to know what this message is. They need to understand it. He's not saying, I want, to, I, I want to make sure that I get it right with them. No, no, he's communicating what is right with them so that they can set it straight, that need to be set it straight, because we see that happening in, in Acts chapter 15. They set it straight. They write the letter to the churches of Galatia. They send people down there and says, tell them we gave no, com no commandment about circumcision. We gave no commandments. We're not going to put a yoke of bondage on these people that we can't even bear. We're not going to put it on the Gentiles. So we understand there's a different message on, uh, that's here. And so Paul goes there to discuss this issue. Lest my enemies I should run or had run in vain. To, 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 the word vain means to no purpose. He says all this work, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, all this work and this message I'm preaching among the churches of Galatia can all go up in smokes if you don't set this issue straight. And we start mixing my gospel with what these, th these people think is a gospel. It can all go up, it, can, it could all be vain, and we need to set it straight. That's the issue that's going on there in verse 2. You guys get that? Look at a couple of verses where he's talking about not running in vain. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5. Paul says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent... I send to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Again, I want to make sure that your faith is sure and straight. I need somebody to tell me that you're sure, because I don't want all this work that has been going on there to be in vain. Who would cause it to be in vain? The tempter. Who's that? <laughs> Satan. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. What, is, what, what Paul consider? Paul doesn't consider the message he's preaching vain or empty. But if he preaches the message and says, you are justified by faith without the deeds of the law, you stand complete in all God's and Christ's righteousness before God, you're accepted in the beloved, that's who you are, that's who God has made you to be, you trust the gospel, you're saved, and now, and, and, and somebody else comes and says something different, and now you say, you know, okay, that will be, you know, I'm wasted all my time here almost with it. His message is not a waste of time, it's the response of the people that is listening to the message that would waste the time. I could preach to you all year long, and after the year you just do your own thing. My message I preach from Sunday to Sunday is not vain, but it would be determined vain when I'm done and nothing's been, you, not, no response to it. It would be vain then. Not because of me, not because of Paul, but because of your response and what you allow to creep in to destroy the message. That's what would make it vain. Did you get that? Galatians chapter 3. Now that's an interesting passage there. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 3 and 4, he says, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made, made, made perfect by the flesh? This is bold words, you know. I'm thinking about that. If I say to you guys this morning, Are you guys so foolish? I'll have a bleeding lip before I walk out that door this morning if I call you foolish or an empty church next week, you know. But Paul goes, he says, are you so foolish having been in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in what? You obviously started right and guess what happened with the starting off with in the Spirit? When you hear this gospel and you believe this gospel of justification by faith, what happened? You suffered a lot of things because of the sake of the gospel. Now you go back and you try to keep bringing the law in and mixing it in with your life and your walk as a believer. Really, he said, all that stuff was for vain for you. You know, all that suffering, standing up for Christ and justification by faith issue. Now you're doing all this stuff. It could be vain. And by the way, Paul says in chapter 1, how long after Paul got in there, established these guys and left, how long did it take before Paul left, before these guys moved in and started corrupting this message there? Soon. 
It was right afterward. These guys, satanic policies of evil is at work today. Let me tell you that. So what I'm seeing is Paul going out here to these to these twelve to set it straight. It's a it's almost and I will give it. All right. I'm going to be quoted on this and I'm going to be suffering for this. I'm going to say it anyway. It is a political move from God's side. Sending him to Jerusalem. Communicating the gospel. Because they say, okay, we got it. Yes, you're right. And we see the evidence of that. You know, let's send letters to Galatia and let's do that. Now, don't go quote me. I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking out loud and I should maybe not even think out loud. Look at chapter, uh, Acts chapter 15 again. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, and um, let's go to verse 24. Verse 23 says, And they wrote letters by them after this manner. That's his council in Jerusalem. Wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Galatia, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from what? Us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So the letters, these, after, after the visit, if Paul never went to Jerusalem, this would never have gone out, and this issue would not have been straightened out. In Syria and Cilicia says, go out here, give them the letters from us, and say, we didn't give anybody a commandment like this. Now, by the way, these guys that went there, Paul, refer, Paul refers to them as brethren. These false, and they call them false brethren. What is the false brother? And what is a true brother? Is the question we have to ask ourselves next. Go with me to Galatians chapter 2 again. Are you finding this interesting? I really honestly pray that I'm not messing this up. Um, chapter 2, verse 2 says, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, that privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Verse 3, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So, by the way, you know, after this visit, you know Paul... And that's why I'm thinking this is a move from Paul, not from, and it's, it's God's at work here. And when I say move from Paul, I'm, God is at work here because God, Paul is full with the Spirit when he's doing this. He's not circumcising Titus. He goes into the, to discuss the issue of circumcision. And what does Paul not do? He does not circumcise Titus. Why? Because the issue is the issue of the law and circumcision. He's not trying to win these people over with the gospel. By the way, let me, show, let me show you something here. Go with me to Timothy, uh, to, to, sorry, Timothy, Acts chapter 16. Let me ask you this. Does Acts chapter 16 and the events of Acts chapter 16 follow the events of Acts chapter 15? Yes or yes? 16 follows what? 15, right? It's not before. Now look at 16 and verse 1 to 3. Then, they came, then, he, then came he to Debra and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timoth Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took him, and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. So he goes right after the Jerusalem council, and he goes and circumcised poor Timothy. And I'm sure Timothy says, you want to do what? <laughs> you didn't circumcise Titus? <laughs> no, but the issue at hand was not to win those people in Jerusalem. They are, they are people that are saved at the, the council. But these people we're going to go to now, they need to hear the gospel. And for them to receive the gospel, I must make you to become all things unto all men. Guess what? You're going to get circumcised. 
Imagining being Timothy, Robert. <laughs> but it, uh, they didn't compel in Acts chapter 15, didn't, because the subject and the issue is, is to get this subject straight about the circumcision and the mixing of the law, and for that reason he's not going to circumcise him. He could have circumcised him and not offend any one of those people there, but the thing is, he was offensive. His move and God's move of Paul going to Jerusalem was an offensive move. It wasn't a defensive move. It was an offensive move. And you guys know football, what's the difference between being offensive and defensive, right? He's going there with a purpose to set this doctrine straight. And he's going for the, for the, for the sake of the gospel and to set it straight so that gospel can go be freely moved out there. Because without this move that he's gone out to Jerusalem, it's going to be difficult to go and preach justification by faith if it gets messed up with the, with the issues of the law and the keeping of the law and circumcision and try to be mixed. Can you see what I'm saying? So, he wasn't compelled. And by the way, the apostles, when he came to Jerusalem, they also said, don't worry about Titus. And I'm sure Titus went, whew, that's a relief. Okay? So, they didn't compel him. Go with me to verse 3 in Galatians chapter 2. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Verse 4 says, Verse 4 says, And that, because the false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So what Paul says, you know what, when we came in there, these brethren falsely, these, these first verse 4 says, and because the false brethren unawares brought in. The subject of circumcision was not brought in by who? Peter, James, and John. They, not the, they didn't bring the subject in of, of the circumcision of the Gentiles. The false brethren brought it in. And they seem to me, if I'm reading this right, it seems to me, even in this council, these false brethren came into the meeting and spy out what Paul is mentioning. And they come into a private meeting almost and listening to what's going on and, and try to put their 10 cents worth in there about the subject. And they bring him in privately. It means like when you, you, they, 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 the, 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 the word has been used there that privately means to, to steal in. But let's talk about these false brethren first for a second here. That word false brethren. Paul uses the word brethren 101 times in the Pauline epistles. 101 times. And it's interchangeably worded with brethren. The word brethren and brethren is the same word. But what goes before the word, it tells you about brethren. A false brethren is somebody that's, that's a pretended associate. They're not really an associate. They pretend to be an associate. They pretend like they're a believer, but they're not. Okay, this is a false brethren. Okay? And those false brethren are the people that brought everybody else under the what? Law. Let me tell you something about false brethren. Paul equals false brethren. Could you imagine being in a storm at sea in a boat, getting shipwrecked and, and broken up and cast into the sea, struggling for the next breath, and just fighting for your life every, every second that you're in that sea in that storm. Can you imagine that? Would that be tough for you to go through, to be in that perils of water? Right? It will be a tough thing. You know what Paul equals that to? Go with me to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians, you're going to get the point that I'm making here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I don't want to throw it away before I get there. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's go to verse 12, uh, maybe 20, 24, 25, and 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, um, let's go from... Verse 23 says, And they, uh, are they ministers of Christ? I speak not as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. A night and a day I've been in the deep. You know what that means? In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, that's just the Jews, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false 
brethren. You would say, you know what, I'd rather be among false brethren than fighting for my life in that deep sea there. Paul it throws them all in the same category. That's how important this gospel was. This is how important the doctrine was that Christ gave him and God gives him to preach because he calls it in perils of false brethren. When these false brethren is accusing him and saying you're wrong, the doctrine, and contends with him, that, that, that contention and disputations that's going on, he's a, it's a peril for him. It's a tough thing to go through. And I tell you what, I would rather take a beating. You know, it's like my kids and I'm small. You know, I would say to you, know, say, look, okay, you know what? I'll give you four or five of the best or right out. I did it one time with him, you know. One time I did that. He says, I'll take right out. I said, okay, book of Ephesians, chapter 6, start writing. And he was not even first through the first chapter and he comes crying and then he says, can I change my mind about, <laughs> can I take the spanking? Because I can get that spanking and it will be hurting me at that moment. But guess what? Ten minutes later or an hour later, it's over. This is carrying on for too long. Paul says, when I'm among those people in perils of my false brethren, and that contention, that's painful. That's hurt, hurting. You know, that, that, that's just terrible. And I've been at places where I've walked in where I know people look at me and they say, this, you're a cult, you're false, and I know how I'm treated. You know how painful it is when people treat you like that? And I'm sure all of you that's come to understand God's Word, right and divided, and start standing for the truth of the Gospel. Standing for the truth of the justification by faith issue, the completeness that we have in Christ, and standing for that against people that's standing for the opposite of that. And that, that way they look at us and the way they talk about us and, and our back, behind our backs. Paul's called it peril of, perils of false brethren. Did that stop him from standing for the truth of the gospel? No, no, no. He went ahead and he stood for it steadfast, which we're going to look at just now. Oh, time's up. <laughs> These Judaizers just wanted to put them under bondage. Look at verse 4, uh, Galatians. And I need to end there. I need to stop. Chapter 2. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in to privately spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us unto bondage. Guess you know what they want to do? What Paul says they want to do? There's no sincerity in these guys, Paul says. Paul says these guys have no, got no clear conscience and stuff. All they want to do is bring us into bondage. That's all they want to do. Look at what Peter says, by the way. Go with me to Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, if you will. Verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, by the way, after this Jerusalem council, the name Peter is not going to come up again. This is the last mention of Peter in the book of Acts. After this issue. Interesting, isn't it? He says, and, 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 and when they had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto their men and brethren, Ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believed. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither your fathers or, nor we we're able to bear. Why would you want to put these guys under a yoke? We couldn't bear it. By the way, Peter's not saying, Peter's not saying yeah, the gospel that he gave me to go preach to the Gentiles was the gospel of the grace of God. He's not saying that. Okay, that's not what this passage is saying. But he says, why do we want to go put the yoke on these guys? We can't even, we as, as Jews, as Israelites, the Israel of God, living under the law of God, we couldn't even bear it. Why do we want to put these people under the bondage? So Peter and James don't want to put these guys under the bondage, but who wants to put them under the bondage? The false brethren. And my, let me ask you, what is the opposite of bondage? Liberty. And in Galatians 5, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. 
These guys don't want liberty. They don't want you to have liberty. You know what? These guys were jealous. These Jews, these Judaizers, these false brethren were jealous of the Gentiles and the liberty they enjoy in Christ Jesus without the deeds of the law as, the, as they walk of sanctification. That's why they kind of messed up that gospel and brought it in there and tried to put a bondage under the Gentiles because some, they, they couldn't stand it. They were jealous. And Paul says, when I was doing that ministry to the Jew first, I was provoking them to jealousy. Let's put these guys under bondage. By the way, and I'm not going to carry on because I want to talk, I want to spend some more time on the issue of verse 5 there. He says, to whom we gave place by subjection, know not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And I want you and I to be challenged by this verse. I need to challenge myself. I'm looking at this verse and I'm challenged by it. The place that he's get no subjection, not for an hour, for the sake of the truth of the gospel, so that it can continue. He stands, and we're going to look at that next week about making a stand for the truth of the gospel. And the contention that goes with that. And we say, oh, you know what, this is an open forum to discuss. You know, this Jerusalem council and Paul's council with these guys was not a forum. Hey, give me your view, I'll give you my view, and let's make a decision. Are oh, we all okay with it? No, there was no, this is not an open forum for views and opinions. This is about the truth of the gospel. And it comes down to black and white and to the line. There is it. I'm going to talk about that next week when we get back. Amen. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your ultimate, this, this wonderful issue of, of being justified by faith without the deeds of the law. We thank you, Father, that we can have life and it abundantly in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, being blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that you've blessed us with, that you've made us accepted in the Beloved, redeemed, uh, uh, giving us redemption through the blood of Christ for the righteousness, His righteousness that we stand in, being in Christ and in you, God. We praise you for this, and we thank you for this, and we thank you for the gospel. And we pray, Lord, that we would be defenders, that we will fight the good fight of faith, that we will run the course as Paul did, and stand for the truth and hold fast these form of sound words. So we pray this in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen.